Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a huge honor. Um, I just want to say right away that probably slightly false pretenses because I'm absolutely not a Chinese scholar in any way. Uh, but uh, what I'm interested in, what I work on, is the issues of power, and particularly power relations, the balance of power. Uh, so that's what I will be talking about more than anything, is relationship between Putin and Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. Um, it is always important how many times the leaders meet, um, how often they meet, uh, how they perceive that balance in their relationship. As you may remember, um, or at least those of you, the scholars of, of uh, China and Russia may know, in 1959, when Nikita Khrushchev uh, went to the United States to promote or agree on the peaceful coexistence strategy with the United States at the time with Dwight Eisenhower, uh, and it worked very well. I mean, I think the trip was very successful, at least for a year only. Uh, but then it still was successful. Uh, he, right after that, he immediately went to China, to Beijing, to convince Mao Zedong that that's okay to talk to the, to the West, uh, that it's really not a threat to communism. So that's how those relationships are really being, being built. And in the last five years, Vladimir Putin and uh, Xi Jinping uh, met over 30 times. That's a lot of meetings that they had in a variety of places. They met this year um, already four times. Um, you mentioned in the last sort of few months, and it is really very important this particular year, has been very important precisely because in June, uh, you may have followed, there is a, uh, something that is called St. Petersburg, uh, Russia's St. Petersburg Economic Forum. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it is an important forum when Putin designed it, decided to, uh, to have it. It's in St. Petersburg, his hometown, and it was Russia's response to the Davos Forum, because Russia always has to have a response to something the West does. So it was the St. Petersburg Economic Forum. And uh, once again, you may remember, uh, after Russia at, uh, annexed Crimea from Ukraine in 2014, the forum was sort of dying down. Very few guests <coughs> were visiting, important guests. And in recent years, uh, in fact, um, that changed. Uh, Emmanuel Macron, I think, was there last two years. I don't remember, but certainly last year. Shinzo Abe of, uh, of uh, Japan was there. Uh, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker was there. Juncker, you pronounce it? Juncker? Juncker uh, was there uh, numerous times. Not numerous, but a few times. So it started picking up. But the most important guest this year was Xi Jinping. And uh, if you follow the news, it was a very dramatic visit because they went to the Bolshoi. You know, when you're in Moscow, what do you do? You go to the Bolshoi. They went to the zoo. They look at the bears because that's what you do at the zoo. Then they went to St. Petersburg. They went to the Hermitage. Well, that's what you do in St. Petersburg. So it was very, very, very um, kind of advertised as the beginning of the new friendship, the, the beginning of new relationship. And they signed over 25 agreements, and there's a hundred billion trade between the two countries. So it was a big story. Of course, Russia needs this. Um, Russia needs this relationship very much. Uh, as I mentioned, annexation of Crimea brought um, kind of all sorts of problems. Uh, Western sanctions were uh, were imposed, and although it didn't do the harm on the economy that the West, the European Union, uh, and particularly the United States expected it to, to do, there was still certain harm was done. And, and also uh, when now, since Putin is no longer a pariah that he was supposed to be after 2014, he does like to expand his kind of the new Warsaw Pact club. If you remember, there was a Warsaw Pact during Cold War, so now it's no, no longer the Warsaw Pact, but sort of a, uh, a club of leaders that um, do not think that Russia should be ostracized, including, by the way, uh, Emmanuel Macron. So China would be relationship with China. China, as part of the new strategic bloc, would be quite a, quite a cap in Putin's feather if, if he can, in fact, convince uh, the Chinese to have something that is called a strategic bloc, which is another interesting thing of the new relationship between 
um, these agreements on new relationship between China and Russia is that China particularly doesn't want it to have a name to it. It doesn't want a coalition, it doesn't want an alliance, it doesn't want any of this. Um, and I will talk about it later a little bit, why is that? Uh, and Putin also is very careful. So they have the relationship, but they don't have a name, uh, which is quite unusual, but uh, also um, probably makes sense uh, in the long run, especially for the, for the Chinese party. Um, China also very much interested in this relationship, of course, because Donald Trump is going all the way with increasing tariffs, and we've been hearing that negotiations are going very well, but they're not going anywhere. Um, and uh, so China is forced to change business practices. And so, of course, uh, Xi Jinping, who is, from my understanding, uh, is quite reserved, when he was in St. Petersburg and uh, in also kind of re recent meetings, he'd been talking about Putin as his best friend, which is, once again, a very important thing for for Putin to have. They just met in, uh, during the summit of BRICS uh, on November 13, I think it was, in Brazil. And both, if you follow, they both slammed uh, Western unfairness and trade, and trade and, and financial dealings and whatnot. So they once again were presenting a bit of a united, united front. There is another project that they're working on. The reason I spend a little bit of time on talking about those projects because they really almost cut across everything. And the latest project is a cultural project. Uh, there is a Repin Institute in uh, St. Petersburg, and it just announced a cooperation with the Chinese Academies in Art Education. Uh, but once again, the interesting thing about art uh, education is not just about art. It's, it's certainly not when <clears throat> China and Russia are concerned. <clears throat> they are, um, the the beginning uh, in the meeting and the sort of the announcement of this art education project uh, was done as a celebration of the 70th anniversary of diplomatic relations. So Russia did have relationship for many years, but it's 70 years of diplomatic relations. <clears throat> and uh, the officials uh, who were uh, in charge of this, uh, they touted that um, project as absolute uh, future success, and I quote, because of the sense of Soviet history and camaraderie. So we're going back to sort of the Soviet uh, Soviet connection between um, uh, between Russia and and China. <clears throat> so both uh, both leaders have been so, have been talking about how they be, they are close like they've never been, and how they are planning to be even more close in the future. What interests me now, although uh, once again, not, I'm not only a Chinese expert, I'm also not a military expert at all, but uh, I do find interesting uh, the expansion, not only in technological projects, because as you know, I can never pronounce it correctly, Huawei, Huawei, the, uh, the phone thing, how you pronounce it? Huawei, sorry. Can't. Because just two languages, Russian and English, just fight each other how to pronounce it. Um, and so, as you know, it was <clears throat> the firm was forbidden in the United States because it's national security problem. Uh, where was it welcomed with open arms in China? And in June and July, there've been numerous meetings. Uh, and uh, so now, how you pronounce it again? Huawei <laughs> is now go partnering with, uh, uh, with MTS, the Russian provider, uh, to set up uh, a 5G technology and become, together, become a leader of the world. So when China is doing it, okay. But when Russia and China are doing it, you know, United States, watch out. So they're very proud of this project. And I also find it very interesting, but I guess, you know, Putin is... We were, it, uh, earlier today, we were talking about the Russian symbol of the Russian coat of arms is a double eagle, so there's always sort of you think one thing and say another. <clears throat> so there was a, uh, there was a, um, a huge drive to um, kind of propagate in the United States through Russia today, RT as we call it now, uh, through RT that 5G technologies uh, uh, is very much related to cancer and it's very bad for your health and the more you use 5G, the more, <clears throat> the more problems you're going to have. 
uh, with deformity of your children, you know, all sorts of horrible things. And yet when China came with its 5G technology to Moscow, suddenly 5G is the, yay, is the big thing. So they're developing, I guess the Chinese 5G is better than the American 5Gs. So they're doing this. Uh, in uh, <clears throat> so this commercial projects and in uh, and technological know-how that Russia is very willing to use and you know the trade war certainly provided Putin with an opportunity to say well we are all up for uh, to have that but what I think should be very worrisome is the um, kind of the new cooperation. It's not necessarily new, but increased cooperation with the, between the Russian army and the, uh, the Chinese army, the, the People's Army of China. Uh, in 1993, there was a, a kind of military agreement, very abstract, really didn't set, uh, set any strict parameters. In 20, two, uh, 2006, 2000, 2007, both, both countries started conducting military exercises together, which, you know, countries do. But um, every year they would come up with a new agreement or the new cooperation agreement on that just for one year. So they, once again, something that I mentioned, they are uh, insisting that it's not a, a long binding agreement. So there's a, um, so we're doing this for the purposes of today, but we'll see how it happens tomorrow. Uh, so these joint exercises were happening, but really never on a larger scale of military technical cooperation. That's where your 5G also become very, very helpful and useful. Um, uh, so now they are actually redesigning, reformulating that agreement of 93 and make it, and make it uh, very much uh, more binding in um, kind of invo involving legal terms and, and, and what not. Uh, and in fact, uh, you may have read um, uh, in the news in July, I think there was a first joint, it's not an exercise, but first joint Russia-China patrol of a long-range bombers over the Sea of Japan. What does it tell us? I mean, of course, Russians wouldn't say why. They just say, you know, <coughs> we are allowed to do this. But in my view, what is happening is that um, Russia is really being now directly involved in uh, China's um, advancement in uh, in the South Pacific, and Russia becomes part of part, a player of this. And we talked about it a little earlier today, that uh, when we uh, when there is a conversation about potential threats in the South Pacific, and you know a variety of actors that can uh, uh, that can um, either um, amend those threats or provide more the more of those. And China is certainly one of those that that uh, with more power than anybody that creates more, uh, creates more threats, mm -hmm. Russia is never part of that conversation because Russia is not seen as an actor in, the South, in, in, in that area, but it can be and it should be. Precisely uh, that new cooperation, that new uh, already formula that, um, that they're now trying to get to, uh, to um, formalize the agreements and their cooperation actually makes Russia a player now in that part of the world too. Um, uh, China is known to be in Africa in a variety of ways. Suddenly Russia, as you, you've, you've read, uh, may, may have read recently the Wagner Group, they are also going into China. A lot of it with Chinese cooperation, oh, sorry, not into China, into Africa. A lot of it with Chinese cooperation. So these things, it's sort of this, of course, we're doing the technology and we are doing the arts, uh, the Repin Institute, but a lot of uh, uh, things also going into the military alliance in which um, they're still not calling it an alliance, but it does look more and more like it is, uh, it is going to be. <clears throat> and this uh, kind of brings me to my point is that, uh, of course, China is the second uh, second uh, largest economy in in the world now. Russia is 15th. Is we're very generous. It would be 13th, I guess. <coughs> but <coughs> um, so Russia is not really a major. Is 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 not having an upper hand of this relationship. Although of course, Xi Jinping is being very partial to Putin and calling him best friend and the best relationship and whatnot. And I would like to remind you of something that didn't end well for Russia, but ended very well for China. 
uh, and somehow people don't talk about it in those terms or don't talk about it enough, and I think what they should. Um, in 2013, as you may remember, Edward Snowden, the uh, NSA whistleblower, uh, was um, uh, in China and then very quickly got out of Hong Kong. And where did he end up? He ended up in Moscow because China decided that it really doesn't want all the dramas with the uh, uh, kind of American political tussle, all the fights, the political fight it didn't want. So I, I cannot say it for a fact because I don't know, but I would imagine they pumped out whatever they needed to pump out of Snowden and just send him to better pastures in Moscow, to colder pastures in Moscow. Uh, and of course, that's when the relationship with the United States started going down. So that was really, that created one of the first ide big ideological fights. And that's when, it's not Crimea, it's that when the, um, when uh, Russia entered into systemic confrontation with the, with the United States. At the time, China stayed away. But now China also has entered into systemic confrontation with the United States. Uh, and uh, more in economic terms, but that military, um, um, military alliance that is being built seems to me that they're really trying to center it as a, um, um, as a, a, a certain type of, um, of um, kind of counterbalance to the United States particularly, but generally to the West, to the West as well. Um, so as I say, Snowden didn't end well for Russia. I mean, Russia would never admit it, but it didn't because he's stuck there. There's, he's giving interviews. He's saying that Russia is a bad regime. Uh, they can't get rid of him. They, they don't need him. So it was, it just created a political crisis like an Ecuador embassy and, and Julian Assange. This is sort of all these things that countries decide to do against the West, but then it ends up not working out the way they thought it would be. <clears throat> And uh, um, uh, so that kind of makes me think that uh, Putin's desire to work with Xi Jinping because he thinks he's going to get something out of uh, China probably is not strategic. Putin is a brilliant tactician. We know that. We've seen it. Um, he um, outsmarted um, Barack Obama in Syria once again got stuck there. What is he? So they kept uh, Bashar al-Assad, but what's the point? Uh, but still outsmarted. So he proved his point. Um, you know, we all know the 2016 elections. Uh, so um, all these things that when Putin outsmarts tactically the West, it ultimately brings more headache than it actually brings brings results. Same thing with with Snowden. And uh, my fear that um, using China as a as a potential as a potential um, sort of comrade in arms against against the uh, ideological fight with the West uh, or military fight with the West, uh, for that matter, may not really work out for Russia that well. Um, one of the things, I mean, historically, uh, and I mentioned Mao Zedong, and. Um, Khrushchev, uh, as you remember, um, so Mao Zedong and Joseph Stalin had to deal with each other because they were both, even if they fought uh, for uh, global recognition of who is, a, um, who is a, you know, the real descendant of Marxism and whose communism is better, uh, they still had to kind of provide a unified people's front against the capitalist West. But when uh, Khrushchev replaced Stalin and uh, uh, then denounced Stalin in 1956, then it really became um, unacceptable for Mao Zedong. He was incensed, uh, resulted in Sino-Soviet um, uh, split, and Khrushchev's visit in 59 to say that we can be friends with America, uh, or at least uh, coexist friendly with, with America, really didn't, didn't help. Um, so my fear that uh, Putin's kind of overtures and uh, accepting of Xi Jinping's uh, goodwill and promises of friendship really wouldn't, mis wouldn't escape uh, the mistakes and uh, miscommunications that were are part of the earlier um, Soviet history. And just a little bit of history since you mentioned 400 years. Um, uh, indeed, um, I was, two years ago I traveled to Blagoveshensk, which is a town on the border with China, with the 
Chinese town of Heihe, right across the Amur River. It's only 500 meters. You really see each other. Uh, and there's this, you know, giant towers, and it's, everything is lit and wonderful and kind of um, you know, slightly cheap, but well done nonetheless, uh, or uh, done uh, or looks well. Uh, but in Russia, there's scruffy streets, um, bad. For example, the Chinese brought the um, uh, the, the the bike lane, not uh, the bikes. And in Heihe, you can actually ride a bike because the bike lanes and all the bikes are functional. And of course, in Russia, there's no bike lanes. All the roads have holes in it. And uh, the bunks, bikes are standing there, but nobody's using them. Um, and uh, uh, so what, what I really was interesting to see there is that uh, that Xi Jinping, Putin's friendship that they're uh, talking about on the leadership level and maybe in sort of this, not maybe, in corporations, those agreements that they signed uh, really doesn't translate in people-to-people -people relationship, which is quite remarkable because the Russians being on the west of China consider themselves the west. So they do look at the Asians and also remember that, um, you know, the Soviet Union was the leader, was was having a leading position vis-a-vis uh, vis-a-vis uh, vis Red China, uh, and the Chinese simply just don't notice the Russians. I myself had this incredible experience. That was at this towns were I mean the Heihe was, I think it I, I don't remember how many people it had. Now it had about two hundred thousand, and Blagoveshinsk has about probably twenty thousand. So that's a counterbalance. Uh, but also he, he was really created, it was a village, and it was created to um, uh, accommodate the shuttle traders. Do you know who the shuttle traders are? These are the people who travel with the, those bags uh, with the, um, Chinese noodles on one side, Russian vodka on the other, and so they trade, uh, they trade. And it's just a horrible, really horrible job. I think it's the worst job that one can have. And I traveled with them, uh, both, both sides. And uh, uh, so the, I was, I didn't have bags because I was just being there. And a Chinese man with two very heavy bags just walked through me. If I didn't jump, jump aside, he would have walked through me. And I asked then um, uh, a Chinese friend who was in, in Blagoveshinsk, who lives in Blagoveshinsk, married a Russian woman. And I said, so why, um, why such animosity? And he said, well, because you don't notice us. We don't notice you. Uh, and uh, just please remember that only 150 years ago, uh, this was all Chinese territory, and one day it will be that. Uh, so all of this was Chinese territory, one day will be that. Uh, and uh, I went to a museum in Heihe uh, in the on the Chinese side uh, and um, just was allowed to go in because foreigners are not allowed in because there's a certain version of Chinese history that only Chinese should have and not the foreigners, so they wouldn't be disputing it. But I was there with the Chinese friend, and so we were able to go in. Um, and they did like Khrushchev, so I was lucky. So they decided that I'm okay to be shown that. Um, and it was amazing, this kind of very similar pictures of uh, Russians taking over the territory from the Chinese, but the Chinese call those Russians, when Russians think that they just brought civilization to this Asiatic parts of the world, the Chinese call them the hairy bar barbarians. And so they continue to refer to them as hairy barbarians. So uh, one of this Xi Jinping-Putin relationship uh, really doesn't take so far, has not taken into, into account, uh, into account that kind of the people to people, <coughs> to people to people relationship. There is another, uh, thing that I witnessed on a, um, in Heihe, but also on, on, I took trains, on trains, there was a lot of Chinese um, workers who uh, log wood. And the, what they do, um, they don't buy wood because it's expensive, and I mean, in China they already probably eliminated, eliminated a lot of it. Um, so they burn the wood, and then they say to those very corrupt governors in the Russian province. It's like, why do you need it? You don't need it. It's already burned. And so then they log it, and then they ship it to, uh, to Russia. Uh, so when Xi Jinping was speaking in St. Petersburg, he was talking about the environmental policy. He was saying that, you know, we're going to provide 
um, uh, green security to the world and whatnot, and, and, and certainly our work in Russia would be very environmental. It is possible that since it's all going to become a middle kingdom one day, who knows, maybe they just don't want to plunge it all together right away. So as I said, Putin is an excellent tactician, but all these tactical advances that he has been uh, so successful in so far really created more of a headache. We talked about it earlier today. It is, does seem to be a Putin moment because everybody else is in trouble and he seems to be presiding over this giant country of 11 time zones with the double-headed eagle and he's friends with Xi Jinping. Um, but at the same time, how long-term this kind of relationship um, can last, I mean, for China, as I said, not a China expert, but for China, it does seem to be much more strategically uh, viable than it is for Putin, because turning to, once again, earlier we talked about somebody, um, I think you asked, why is it all, all eggs in one basket? Why go to China versus everybody else? And my response was Russia has never had really uh, any uh, strategic capacity. Tactically, it has been winning, as Donald Trump likes to say. Um, he's not doing that. Uh, has been winning, but it essentially always lose in strategic terms. And that's why it always keeps recycling its, so you said 400 years, it sort of, it keeps talking about itself. I mean, that double eagle, it keeps talking about itself as if it's just Byzantium collapsed, not in 14, what was that, 1473, 53? Uh, 53? 1453, not in 15, not in 1453, but say 2014. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nina. Um, your um, presentation has raised very many interesting questions, um, not least um, the kind of uh, uh, phenomenon that history uh, tends to repeat itself between uh, Russia and China. Uh, you mentioned the um, denunciation of Stalin by Nikita Khrushchev being uh, very badly received by uh, Mao Zedong. I think it's uh, equally clear uh, that uh, the uh, Gorbachev uh, reform, quasi-revolution, was equally badly received by Xi Jinping um, when you talk about uh, the uh, Russian uh, settlement near the border with China, uh, it raises the question of uh, the phenomenon of the Pochamkin village, which is a very Russian kind of phenomenon. Um, and overall, I think that um, there is a contrast between uh, the strategic patience, uh, which is evident in China, and I think uh, the need for uh, support and uh, evident progress uh, in Moscow, which um, China doesn't necessarily uh, want to meet all of a sudden. When you mention the, uh, the claims um, that the uh, Chinese population mentioned to you, um, I'll always uh, remember that despite the fact that uh, there have been formal agreements on the border between Russia and China, uh, Chinese children's textbooks still mention uh, a, a claim for one and a half million hectares yep. against Russia, despite the fact that they're in agreement. So uh, there is a lot to play for. Um, when you mention Africa and uh, uh, the Pacific, it also occurred to me that um, Chinese uh, Navy has engaged in exercises with the Russian Navy in the Baltic mm -hmm. and also in the Eastern Mediterranean. Yeah. So um, There is quite a lot going on there, but um, it's not clear where it will all end up. Um, I throw the floor open to your questions and your comments. Uh, if asking a question or making a comment, uh, would you please say uh, who you are and what your uh, affiliation is? Uh, well, my name is uh, Jim Dorgan. I'm just a member of the Institute. I just wanted to ask you a question wh which does puzzle me a bit about Russia. You mentioned the economy of Russia. The, uh, just check this. The Russian economy, by some measures, is smaller than that of Canada. But it's putting it's an awful... than Italy. Well, it's certainly smaller than Italy, but even Canada has a smaller population than Italy. So 
But in any case, we know it's small. But the amount of hard ministry hardware they're putting out is, is, is rather impressive, I have to say. I mean, we're talking about hypersonic nuclear bombers and gliders, actually, and uh, torpedoes that can go 400 kilometers an hour underwater and things mm -hmm. like this. This is expensive stuff. Yep. And I just wonder where the money is coming from to do this. Bearing in mind, too, another thing, that the Russian economy is a one-trick economy. It has oil, not much else. And but that's what it's going $50 to. $50 a barrel. But that's exactly well, what it's will going the, to. Well, okay, but the question is then, how long are the public going to put up with the situation where they have guns but no butter? No, that's, that's, <laughs> that's you know, as, as Gorbachev used to say, in your question, there is an answer. Exactly. I mean, you know, it was a military-industrial complex of the Soviet Union. They were, uh, in fact, in 59, that, you know, famous visit, uh, as you may remember, it was not just the Khrushchev visit, <coughs> uh, Khrushchev's visit to the United States, but they also brought the, um, um, the each country brought an exhibition to another country. Um, and so with, with um, people, the guides of the, of the exhibition and, and whatnot, and there was famous American exhibition, which Richard Nixon was vice president at the time, uh, and uh, uh, he, Eisenhower wanted to bring all the military stuff to show the Soviets what he can do, being the general. And Nixon memorably said, the power of butter is stronger than the power of guns. So the Soviets tasted Pepsi-Cola for the first time. They saw the model American kitchen and all these other things. Color TV. I, mean, I can remember this myself. I tell you, color TV was one of the things that they brought. Exactly. And so, but the Soviets, of course, brought their tanks and tractors and things that the military industrial complex. Uh, so it has always been, I mean, that's, that's how they think. They, they think in those torpedoes. But, you know, the, Putin is cleverer than the rest in, in, in a tactical uh, sense because there is, I mean, he, with, a lot of disillusionment in um, uh, kind of all the political formulas and uh, opportunities for people. Bread and circuses, they really figured out to the point because the, the, um, the kind of food courts that Russia has and not just Moscow, you would not dream of it. I mean, honestly, if you want to, <laughs> before it all collapses, I suggest you go and visit because it, I've never seen anything like that. It's more than even a lifestyle. It is something existential. Uh, so they are doing better than this in, in, but yes, absolutely, of course. And you know, please do remember that there is a lot of oligarchs who owe Putin their existence. So if there's a torpedo to make, here it is. Somebody, somebody's going to pay for it. Thank you very much, Professor, for a very interesting presentation. Um, Donald Denham is my name, I'm a member of the Institute. Uh, I was wondering, is there any potential for uh, good news stories emanating from this relationship, for example, in terms of the environment, the Arctic, space exploration? Uh, and while I have the mic and while you're here, do you have any comment on the testimony of Dr. Hill in uh, Congress yesterday? <laughs> uh, is there any good of this relationship? Of course, there's always a good in this relationship. Uh, in, in any relationship. I think this starting with a kind of negative, um, already with a negative point, because they talk about cooperation, but both of them are doing it because the West has done something that they think maligned them in one way or another. And that's why I mentioned Snowden, because Putin charged on Snowden. He didn't like Barack Obama, so he thought he's just going to stick it to Barack Obama. And China stayed away, but now China is not. So yes, of course, absolutely. But if their major point is to stick it to the West, it's going to be framed this way. So even if they go into space, it's going to be yet another kind of underlying, uh, underlying uh, narrative. So and in this sense, I think it's, it, it is harmful just, just because it's, it's done um, uh, not because of cooperation, but because to, um, to get to somebody else. Uh, Fiona Hill is an old friend, uh, so I was very proud of her, the way she was holding herself. I was expecting a little bit more explanation as to the sources of Russia's conduct, 
because being a Russian in the United States right now is really not a pleasant experience, I must say, because you know you say, hi, I'm a Russian, and it's like, oh, that <laughs> Russian professor. <laughs> um, uh, so I really expected, and she and I talked about a lot, you know, how one of the problems is that um, there is certain rhetoric being chosen about Russia, some of it correct, but a lot of it is blown out of proportion with no analysis. Uh, once again, go back to George Kennan, the sources of Soviet conduct, the sources of Russian conduct, nobody talks about it. And she's very good at that. I mean, she wrote a book about the sources of Putin conduct. So I expected more, and i kind of slightly concerned that um, by, uh, she was very measured, very good, very explanatory, but um, by saying that Putin is undermining American democracy, it, explaining other things with it, uh, people only hear, or many people only hear, Putin is undermining American democracy. And from then on, that's how we're going to deal with it. So I already read today that a lot of her testimony was taken out of context. And it was like, oh, that Russian scholar, she just told us it's not just about Ukraine. It's what we're bringing it back to Russia. How wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, she and I are going to have a conversation about this. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Michael Sanfi, the po of the Policy Planning Unit of the Department of Foreign Affairs. And it's very interesting to me that you've mentioned Edward Snowden a few times. But actually, I wonder, could it not be argued that it's rather advantageous for Russia to have Edward Snowden? Because, for example, he left Hong Kong, where, as we know, you know there's incredible mayhem happening in Hong Kong. Now, it doesn't seem to be reflecting very well in China in terms of its approach to freedom. And Snowden uh, was the keynote speaker uh, by video link at the Lisbon Web Summit only two weeks ago. So he's kind of a, quite a big deal still. And the fact that he's based in Russia, it just seems to me that it's you know, quite advantageous for Russia that he's there. OK, um, yes, I think, I, I think you know, your, your, um, your point of view of this is as good as mine. I, and it's possible that today it plays out that he may, I don't know. I, I do know that Putin hates him. He wants him out. Uh, that um, it was a lot of a headache. And I don't, I actually don't know how advantageous it is to Russia because I don't see, I, I mean, I, I see your point and it may, and, and probably is, could be correct. I just don't see um, why Russia needs yet another headache of saying, oh, uh, it supports and harbors all these people who go against democracy or uh, proper channels of communication and whatnot. So Russia, once again, uh, is playing the enfant terrible. And I'm not sure it's such a wonderful thing for, for Putin. But, but the way you put it is exactly how Putin would twist it, although he does I do know it for a fact, he hates Snowden's guts because Snowden betrayed the security of the country. And of course, it's not his country and good for Snowden, Putin may think, but as a, his own KGB, as his own, because he is himself a security man, he does uh, consider Snowden a traitor and he wants him out uh, and um, uses, I guess, uses him, but. Well, I, and of course it's true that Edward Snowden ended up in Moscow by accident. Mm -hmm. He was aiming to go to a uh, Latin American Absolutely. country. Absolutely. Jill. Uh, Jill Donahue, uh, Director of Research at the Institute. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I had the privilege of living in Russia um, uh, when Putin came into power, and um, uh, one of the first words I learned in Russian was Husha, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. The soul. There you go. I see you've written about uh, going in, in search of the soul of the Russian Empire. And you've also written about animosity by tea on the part of, say, the Russian people. And I just wonder, what did you find? And did I find the soul? Did you find the soul? I'm just wondering, you know, uh, what, the, what the feeling is, uh, is it the, the deeper sense of uh, what it is to be a Russian nowadays and how the, the Russian populace are coping with that fatigue as Russia being against everything rather than standing for something because it's a very proud cultural mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you. Um, I was I did this trip two and a half years ago, so it's different now. 
because now they are tired of animosity, and Russians are tired of animosity, but at the time they were not yet. So it, it was 2017. It was before Putin got reelected. Putin took the elections again in 2018. I can't say reelected. Um, so it was it was before that. I, the sole part is be, because the title. I think my editor wanted the title of, you know, how Putin collapsed the country. Something like we can't collapse. But if and I. And I said, if you want a cliche, I'm going to give you a cliche. Here is the empire word in it, and here is the soul word in it. So you want that? She said, yes. Like, okay, fine. You want to have it. So it was, it was more of a, I was almost mocking people who only think in Russia in those terms. But searching for the soul was an interesting thing because um, it was, I think for me it was searching for, first of all, I'm a privileged Moscovite who lives in New York now. So it's, we don't go to the provinces. We privileged Moscovites don't go to the provinces. We actually have the provinces come to us. So the fact that I was able to go through the country was a remarkable opportunity and was just what I've seen. I actually, I came back from the trip, it's not the soul, but when I came back from the trip, I, I was, I was, saying, and probably even wrote it in the book, uh, is that if I were Putin, I think I'm God. And he thinks he's God. Because when you go through all of this, you actually think that you're God, because you have all this. You have Germany on one side, you have China on another, you have Mongolia, you have Genghis Khan right on the border, uh, you have Sarah Palin saying hello. You remember that she was seeing, <laughs> she was looking in the Russian back, backyard from the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so it is, it is grandiose. I mean, it is a grandiose country, but and it's also kind of a small observation, but I think a very important one. I mean, we always talk when we talk about countries, we always talk about how great people are, and people are great everywhere. I mean, it is every country um, uh, stands on its great people, but when it's such a giant country with such horrible tragic, violent history, when every leader comes in and deletes the previous one, even if, you know, even Khrushchev who tried not to kill, still deletes the previous one, essentially eliminates the, um, uh, the grassroots existence of people because the new system comes in and says, you're not doing this, you're doing this. And uh, uh, when I was traveling, and that's, I guess, that could be the soul uh, that uh, Russian people are like snowdrops. Just there's a sweeping winter comes, storm destroys everything, and here they are spring, and here they are walking up again, and they're having their new business and their new cafes. And there was a wonderful city, right smack in the middle of Moscow, or middle of Russia, called Omsk, uh, and a wonderful city, really wonderful. Tortured to death because they were for five minutes they were the capital of the White Army when the army was was going to Siberia thinking that um, the Red Army would stop somewhere and then they can come back. So completely tortured by his, that, that history thinking they could have been that capital of Russia, of the white Russia at the time. And there's a Lenin Street because there's always a Lenin Street. And uh, uh, there is a cafe on the Lenin Street called New York <laughs> because what else are you gonna have on the Lenin Street? And you walk into that cafe and the first thing you see is a special for today was um, a blackboard and it says, coffee, drink, Trump. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I tried. Some cappuccino with molasses and caramel in it. Disgusting. And I said, uh, so is it a compliment or is it a, um, is it a mockery? <laughs> and the barista, a wonderful woman, she said, whichever you want. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there, thank you very much for the talk. My name is Zarin Burnett, and I'm a freelance journalist and a member of the IEA's Emerging Voices Group. And I have a question quickly about the Western Balkans, um, because, of course, Macron's famous little no to the Western right. Balkans some time ago, um, leaving room open, for example, for extensive Chinese investment in the area. Of course, since we're talking about Russia and China, that leaves open the, the whole idea of that's sort of in the, in the Russian backyard. So. Um, if Europe sort of leaves that area alone because of Macron's mm -hmm. decision, 
um, how might um, how might the sort of this this Russia Chinese friendship play out in a place like that? Go in, because I mean that's that's what they do, and that's you know one of those things. I think Putin is using all the time is that Western hypocrisy. He keeps saying, well, you promised this, you tell this, you said you're going to do this, and then you don't do this. How are we going to behave? Of course he's going, he goes, we talked about it earlier, please forgive me those who heard it. Um, I'm, because I look at power, I always look at uh, what kind of sports the great leaders or not so great leaders do. He's a judo master. As a judo master, he sees a weakness, he goes in. So it's an empty, sp an empty space. He cannot not go in. Which way, we don't know. How much, we don't know. But he cannot not go in. Because the West gave that, essentially gave it to him. He is, and they already used um, various manipulative techniques in, uh, in, uh, in the Balkans. And we also know that money is power and so all these rich Russians, not all, many rich Russians, went into... Uh, Macedonia, they went into Albania, and they bought properties there. They have wonderful properties, and a lot of it is owned by the Russians. So I think it is a big question for the West generally is that when um, I was George Cannon's last research assistant, which was the most amazing. I, when I say that, I can't believe that it actually happened to me. George Cannon was this great American diplomat who mm. described the sources of Soviet conduct, the Soviet behavior. And he always said that uh, policy should be measured not in two years, not in five years, but at least in 10 years. So when these decisions are being made, they should be made. I mean, one of the great examples is Georgia, our Georgia, not American Georgia. I'm in Europe, so I shouldn't say that. But in America, you always have to qualify. Uh, so in uh, Georgia, when uh, um, uh, they, are, they want to be members of NATO, they want to be members of European Union, uh, they were all they used um, by the West against the when Russians went in in 2008. There was all these things promised, and we are going to you know make you work forward. And then of course everybody left because the minute the war is over, everybody left. And who goes in? The Iranians go in. And the Iranians, if you if you uh, land in uh, uh, well, it changed a little bit because they have a European president, French woman president. Um, uh, so she stopped that practice. But for two years, you fly into Tbilisi, you have, um, you have flights from Riyadh, from Tehran, from Moscow, and some third, I mean, fourth place. It could be from the Czech Republic, it could be from Ireland, from somewhere. But three of them are taken very heavily. Oh, and, and uh, sorry, and one is from Azerbaijan. Because these people come with money and they buy property. And Georgia has these wonderful laws when you can buy, you cannot buy land, um, you cannot buy farmland, but you can buy anything with no question asked. And so Iranians and the Russians and, and the Russians are now own half of the Black Sea resort in, in Georgia. So the same thing. And it's saying that how dare Putin, and he would say, Macron, what were you thinking? What, you thought they were just going to turn around and collect stamps with you? I'm not going to. You, you give me an opening, I'm going to use it. And, and uh, something that we really should always think about this, that often, especially in the United States, they think that they decide something and that's how it's going to be. They decide something and that's not how it's going to be because there is another side to it. We have the last three questions. Noel. Uh, Noel Dorr, a member of the Institute. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I think you said that Russia, in a sense, sees itself as the West vis-a-vis -vis China. I know you said you're not a China expert, but I wonder if you would have any comment on how China would see Russia. Would it always, at a deep level, see Russia as the West and remember the 19th century and so on? Uh, so that the present relationship between the two leaders would be a temporary one, but at the deeper level and in Kennan's 10-year perspective, there would always be this China feeling of the West, of Russia as really a part of the West. Thank you for this. Uh, I can only speculate, but I think Russia, I mean, China, Russia is the West for China because it is to the West. And in fact, when I went to Heihe and I was looking at, uh, from, from the embankment, I was looking back at Russia and I was with a Chinese friend and there was a group of young people, I mean, they're 
you know, a few young people, I think one a couple, and they were pointing their fingers on the other side and saying that's the West. So they see it as the West, not necessarily in terms we understand we, when we talk about the West, uh, which is Europe, but um, uh, so for them it's the West. But I think that's why Xi Jinping is so relishing that kind of upper hand that he has over the Russians because they, they now send the men um, they send the man in space. They have a space program. I mean, it took them much longer than the rest of, of those in the Cold War, but they did it. They had the Olympics, so they're really relishing to, um, their advantages and their advancements. And I think the 5G technology is particularly very interesting because the Russians, as great as they think they are, and uh, they have very difficult, I mean, actually, I'm kind of fascinated by the fact that they were able to figure out the food courts, just a restaurant, just shocking to me. But okay, I mean, maybe they will figure out something. But the Russians have never, at least so far, have not really been able to, to your rocket, uh, have not been able to put soft power things into production. I mean, Russia always has one amazing thing. It's going to be the longest cord in the world. They are going to be making that longest cord, but it's going to be one cord. KGB had the best computer, but it would be one computer. Uh, and the Chinese aren't they're doing these things that Russians can't, because Russians are grandiose. I mean, I don't know if China is grandiose. I guess it is, but not in, the, in those Byzantine terms that Russia is grandiose. Because even if you look at Russian literature, it's all war and all peace, all crime and all punishment. Like, give me something small. But it's never. I mean, any every book is all something. It's just give me tiny. There's no tiny. And because there is no tiny, uh, the 5G Russians cannot do because they don't do tiny. Uh, and the Chinese can. And so they come in with their know-how. And until recently, it's the Russians who would go with know-how. And I think that reversal of the West is probably something that the Chinese um, are very proud about. And that's why when the man jumped through me, who am I? <laughs> Hello. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Kresheva, for your talk. My name is Alexander Davey from the Trinity Centre for Asian Studies. Um, and I have a question regarding, um, you mentioned the Wagner Group. And I'm wondering, um, in relation to China, has there been or is there any evidence of cooperation between the, P the People's Liberation Army and the Wagner Group? Whether that be in Africa? I, I cannot answer this question. I, I don't know. Don't know. No, I really don't know. I know they've been doing some very shady deals together, but I really, I'm not an expert on this. I never studied. I didn't even write about the Wagner Group, so I can't tell you. I okay. know just in general that it's happening, but unfortunately, I'm, I'm just not going to make up something yeah, that yeah, I don't for know. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Apologies. Last question here. Connor Daly, Connor Daly, member of the Institute, Dr. Khrushchev, thank you for your presentation. Talking again about China and Russia, do you see any commonality between the treatment by both countries of their ethnic minorities? So I'm thinking about, in particular, the treatment of the Muslim minorities, so the Chechens, maybe the Tatar in Tatarstan, uh, the fact that recently Tatar is no longer taught as a, 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 as a subject in schools, so the, children in Kazan do not learn through Tatar any longer under the Putin time. Parallels between that and what we're seeing in, um, in Xinjiang province in the west of China, mm -hmm. Kazakhs, Uyghurs, and in general the, the vision that both countries have of the nation state. And a, a small parallel follow-up question. Do you see any, any merit in the, the hypothesis of Eurasianism that was invented after all by, by Russians, Nikolai Trubitskoy in the 20s? Do you think that there is such a thing as Eurasia and is this relationship between uh, Putin and Xi Jinping may maybe a precursor of what we can come to expect? Well, um, thank you. This is a very <coughs> complicated and very um, philosophical question, which I'm not sure I can, I can answer. Um, I, think, I think they do think in, in those terms, because Russia, as I keep saying, that Russia is a Western country. I mean, we, um, I call it the unwest. It's sort of the country that has all the formulas of the West, but because it cannot uh, run fast enough, it says, well, we are our own civilization. We have a soul, 
talking about the soul. But Russia is not a civilization. There is no civilizational. <coughs> China is a civilization. Persia is a civilization. Russia is not a civilization. There is nothing civilizational about anything Russian because even its early beginning, the Kievan Rus was not a civilizational project. It was a you know, the influence of Greece, influence of Byzantium, it's never, never had its own ideology of anything. It's the, and, but it has developed an ideology what the West is not. So Russia, what the West is not, but all the Western definitions and formulas, which makes it the West. So in this sense, it is an interesting, so it keeps looking at the West, but the West says, well, we're better than you, and you're part in Asia, so just go there. And then Russia goes, goes there, but Russia keeps, Russia is not an Asian civilization. It really is not. And it does look, I mean, Putin loves the Eurasianists. He loves the Ilyins and the Berdyaevs and all the, the Ruski Mir and the whatever. So I'm sure he's thinking that. I think his problem is that he's thinking as the Eurasian, Eurasianists did, that he's the center of it. And then China is a, kind of the Asian part that we are going to civilize. But it's no longer the case. So even if they think that, once again, it is on, it does exist, it's on Xi Jinping's terms. So it's his, rather than Putin's way against the West, it's Xi, Jinping, Xi Jinping's way into the West, uh, which really doesn't work very well for Putin, I'm afraid, or for Russia, for that matter. But I'm sure they're thinking that. I mean, you know, the, uh, the, the Dugan philosophy, all these <laughs> philosophical formulas that they suck out of their fingers going back to, as I said, I mean, Byzantium collapsed in 1453. Are we talking about it? It was just yesterday. Uh, so yes, but that's what I think the tension for Putin is that he thinks he's going to, you know, the big brother see, but we're Western. And see things that you are 15 size economy. I'm going to take you over in a second. We're going to use your military power and then take you over with it. Um, so, but I really don't, I mean, I'm, I'm like Putin, I'm not a strategist, so I don't predict. I can only analyze what, what's, what's here and uh, um, what may or may not work in, in shorter term. And who knows, in George Cannon's 10 years, you know, what if Trump, Donald Trump pushes the button and all of us go somewhere? Thank you very much, Nina. Uh, by the way, um, we had um, Fiona in here when she was still a member of the Brookings Institution. She still is. Uh, well, she was in the Brookings Institution when she spoke to us here. And we share completely your admiration for her. Uh, we think, I think we've been very privileged uh, to get your insights uh, today on this question. Um, your insights are all the more valuable in that um, you are a, a Russian who lives and works in the United States. Um, as for understanding Russia and the Russian soul, I can't do better than the, uh, I think it's a Russian cliche by now, it's a quotation from Tuchev, I think. Um, you don't understand Russia, you love Russia. Uh, it, it's not, it's not uh, uh, something that one can analyze. Um, I think it's a fair summary of uh, your presentation as far as Russia is concerned. Um, the relation between Russia and China is, of course, crucial to us all, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, and it's one of the reasons why we have um, proposals coming out from people like Emmanuel Macron more recently. Um, it presages, uh, I think, uh, a new and different world order uh, you very rightly say that um, it's not possible to characterize uh, exactly the Russian-China relationship, nor do they want the re relationship to be described. Uh, in some ways, I think um, one of the best descriptions uh, I have heard of it uh, was from Bobo No, whom you may know, mm -hmm. uh, who calls it a warry embrace. Right. Uh, that might be the yeah. best characterization of it. Thank you very much. Thank you.